and get started. All right, so uh, in chapter three, what we're going to talk about is tokenization, and um, then in chapter five, we're going to get to part of speech tagging. And so this chapter really expands on what we've got, we talked about in chapter two, uh, all the different possible corpora that you can use and some cool things that we can do with it. And then this one's going to expand the repertoire of options that you have to um, process text. So we're going to talk about importing raw text and HTML, and then later we'll work with some XML. So one thing to note is that text can be many different types. So it doesn't have to be just from a, a known corpus. We can begin to create our own variables. So in this particular lesson, we're going to um, work with here, um, let me zoom out a little bit more, um, NLTK, RE for the regular expressions package, and pretty print for pprint. Okay. And we're also going to import the word tokenize function from NLTK. And that will allow us to create lists of words because tokenization is a um, process in which we take strings of lots of characters and break them into either sentences, paragraphs, or words. We can also do characters, but generally we're focusing at the word level. So let us learn how to import things. So this will be partially, par uh, also partially the assignment for this chapter. So uh, let's say we want to pull some text from somewhere on the internet, um, which is generally kind of where you're going to be collecting data from. So it might be from Kaggle, it might be from uh, Project Gutenberg, it could be somebody's website. Um, we do some work where we pull things from Fox News, like we're interested in text in general and that's what the internet is. And so we can actually do that as long as you're connected to the internet by using the request function. So URL lib is a package um, or library that we should have as part of downloading Anaconda. Uh, and we're going to import the request function. So that allows me to access anything on the internet. So that could be a web page or it could be a web source. Um, like this Project Gutenberg one is a text file. And so to figure out what this one is, what we can do is just copy the link our, and go to it ourselves. Uh, okay. Or Project Gutenberg could be down and this could not work today. <laughs> oh man, it is a Monday on a Thursday. Let's see if maybe it's just being mean to me. Okay, so let's say we just pick a random book here. And you can search for books. Let's, let's see if we can find um, Huckleberry Finn. Okay. Nope. So I don't think their website is totally working correctly today. Um, but if you find a book when this when the website works, you can essentially get to the text file associated with that book, and that's what you want to do. So here we found the specific text file, and it does look like it worked. It seems to have opened it, even though the particular searching options don't appear to totally be working on this website. Um, it does seem that it found the book for us, but this is what the format will look like. It'll end in .txt. So right now we're opening text files from the internet. You can also open text files from your computer. So we're going to say request, that's the function, um, dot open a URL. So the function um, is URL open. And then you throw in the URL that you want. Okay. Now this doesn't have to be text. It could be a raw HTML page, but there's better ways to do that. And when you save that, though, it becomes this weird um, HTTP response object, so we're going to have to convert that into something usable. So a lot of what we're going to do from here on out is think about um, different processes one does in it, uh, natural language processing and how do we convert from one to object to another. So this particular type of object is not usable at the moment. We're going to have to convert it into something usable. And that's where word tokenization comes in. And so we're going to put that into a readable format for us. So this is uh, Crime and Punishment is the book. Um, and so we'll use the dot read function, which reads in the information that you've imported, and dot decode, actually together. So this is a really strange to me looking one because it's response dot read dot decode. And remember that response is a variable we created over here where we opened what was in the URL. 
So request.url open kind of pulls in the information, read, opens it effectively, reads it in. Decode translates uh, this into a format that we can use. Okay, so we talked a little bit in a previous lecture about um, different, different uh, formats that text can take. Um, and so obviously Latin-based languages and then like chi um, Chinese or Japanese, if you're using the ideographs or the little characters, that's going to be a different um, fun a different character set or Arabic or Cyrillic. Like those are all look different. And dot decode is a function that allows us to translate between them. Um, and so dealing with special characters is going to be an interesting problem depending on what language you want to work with. And so we can decode this into UTF-8. Uh, I did this a little differently than the, the book chapter because this one works better. It's a newer format. Um, but we could decode this into a different set of characters. Okay, so we just want to make sure we're using a, a decode option that matches the character set that we have. Okay. Um, usually somebody asks, so how do I know? Um, trial and error. Or it sometimes is easier to look up, you know, what character set is Cyrillic? Right? And so what um, encoding should I use? Okay. <clears throat> so when I translate this, we're going to use the word raw here to be in a raw string. And that's just a, a naming mnemonic that people like to use when they mean like it's not been tokenized. It's not been done anything to it is raw. It's the format that we got it in. It's like raw meat. And then later we're going to cook it. Um, and so we're reading it and decoding it into this UTF-8. If you've ever switched between different types of computers, like a Mac and Windows, this is one issue that you might have with them, is the encoding is slightly different in each one, so you might have to translate them. And if I print the type, before this was an HTTP call, or an object type, now it's a string. Okay. And strings we can work with. So we've converted by reading it and decoding it. And then I just told it to print out so that you could see what it is and it's crime and punishment. Okay. So when you do this on your own um, with, for the assignment, you want to pick a different book. Okay. One thing to notice here too are these end of line characters. So slash R and slash N are different types of end of line characters that you might see in raw text. So we're going to have to deal with those next. Um, and this is because any text that we're pulling in our own is going to be very messy. So we're working on uh, some research right now. Where we're talking about the best way to process text. And so we had to talk about, like, okay, tokenization, which we're going to cover today, then limitization, which we'll also talk about, but probably next week. Um, how do I deal with end of line codes? How do I deal with funky symbols? Like, how does one strip out all the nonsense essentially in a text? And so tokenization is kind of a broad term for creating strings of a certain type. And so word tokenization is where you take a um, character, a big long string, and break it into individual words. We've actually kind of already used this on the slide, but sentence tokenization is where you create sentences. You can also create paragraphs or um, chapters, like we can work at different levels. Okay, so tokenize. Um, generally is at the word or sentence level, um, but it could be bigger than that. <clears throat> so let's use word tokenize here, and we're going to call this tokens. We called the first one raw because it was the raw word format. We hadn't done anything to it yet. We're going to call this one tokens because we've broken it into individual words. Remember, we've using, been using token as a, a list of words. And it's a nice, easy function, word tokenize. If I print the type, it now becomes a list instead of a character string because it's a list of individual words. And this looks pretty good, right? It's broken down each word. Um, uh, punctuation become their own words, unless it's an abbreviation. Um, and all the end of line codes are gone. All right. Excuse me. 
Now I could take that list, convert it into NLTK text um, by using something like NLTK.text and throw in the tokens. Okay. What that does for me is it allows me to use concordance, similar, like everything that you are doing for the chapter two, one and two homework. The next issue, though, is that there's a bunch of stuff in this file. Okay. I wish I could pull it up so I could show you kind of the whole file, um, but it doesn't look like Gutenberg's going to let me. Maybe now? Oh, doesn't look like it. Um, and so if I, let's say, just printed raw, the raw word format, this is going to be a bunch of stuff. Um, oh, we used uh, raw again later. <laughs> Hold on. Let's try. Okay. Um, okay, now it's not going to work. Let's try again. Okay, that ran. I don't know why it's opening but not working in browser. Okay. Print the whole raw word format. Here we go. So there's a bunch of crap at the beginning, is what I'm trying to say. So we've got um, all of the information from Project Gutenberg that they've stuck at the beginning. This ebook is free for anyone. You can copy it, give it away, blah, blah, blah. Um, the release date, yada, yada, yada. So we're wanting to clear all that out because this is information metadata or data that's about the book itself, but not the actual text of the book. So we don't want to include any of this in our analysis of the book because it's not literally part of the book. And so what I want to do is figure out how to exclude that data. And this is a little bit of trial and error where what we're going to do is use uh, the find function or the rfind function, which is sort of like find in Word. So like a control or command F. The issue with these two that we'll talk about some other finding options is it only looks for the first instance. So find finds literally the first time whatever you're searching for happens. R find, reverse find, finds the last time that something happens. Um, so from the end. That's useful for this particular instance where we're just trying to find the beginning of chapter one, essentially, because chapter one's not going to happen again. But if you're trying to find every instance of a particular word, this function doesn't work for you. So um, we're going to use the raw string. OK, notice that I'm not using my tokenized string. Um, what I want to do is go back to the raw data set. And I'm going to find where it says part one. When you go to do this on your homework, it might not be part one. It might be chapter one. It might be um, the first few words of the first paragraph of the book. So you'll need to open that text file and kind of look at it to figure out what this should be. Okay, this is not prescriptive. It doesn't mean that it always says part one. It's just that in this particular book, that is where chapter one starts. Then I also want to find from the end where it says the end of Project Gutenberg's crime because this is the, the end of the book. So I scrolled down to the bottom and I looked at the end and this was where the last chapter ends. Since the raw data says one huge character string, this is the index where part one starts. So part one is at index 530, 5000, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the end of Project Gutenberg's crime is at the last, this longer index. Okay. So what we want to do is pull everything between those two. And so we're going to say, uh, give me only the things in between those. And that's when I'm going to strip off the outsides. Okay. Uh, great question. This is only going to find the first time that it's mentioned. Um, and so that's why I said it's important for you to open the book to know where, what it is that will be the marker for like chapter one. So find and rfind only find the first mention or the last mention. 
if you want to find all the time something is mentioned, there's a different function for that. So that's the important thing to remember about the find function. Um, so taking a brief aside, so that's text files, let's look at um, um, HTML. So a quick backup for a second. So this, what this does is it takes my raw format here and now I have a usable um, raw document that doesn't have all the extra stuff. So sometimes I joke with, with my um, or lab research team that we spend more time cleaning text files than we do actually running the analysis and figuring out all the ways that people like wrote goofy things so we could take them out. And that's true of most NLP projects. You spend a lot of time cleaning the documents because they're never quite in a good, nice, tidy format. Um, so for raw text files, we might cut out all the pieces we don't want. If we were to look at HTML, this gets even trickier because um, on BBC's website, there's this like ridiculous joke article about how blondes, people who are naturally blonde, will sort of disappear from genetics because they're a recessive trait or something. Like there's some silly reason and it's a joke article. Um, so let's say we open that. Okay, and newer, newer websites are even worse. They're even harder to process. And so we put in our URL. We'd request URL open URL. And then I just tacked on and did this all in one step. Um, so I read it and I decoded it. I used a slightly different decoder because it worked better okay, than UTF-8. And here's a quick picture of why this is so ridiculous. Um, and I think when you go to run your own uh, website, when you're practicing this on the homework, you'll see that you get all of the HTML metadata. So let's look at... Um, what of you guys, or what is your favorite news source? So, somebody give me their favorite news website. Whoever gets there first. Google? Okay. We can look at two, a couple of them. Business Insider. Oh, Wall Street, that's a good one too. So, I haven't looked at Google News' website in a long time. Oh yeah, so it would be very difficult to, let's say your, your goal was to do some web scraping. You were trying to pull out all these different articles, right? Um, so let's look at Sarah Sanders here. Okay. This is actually probably gonna take us somewhere else. So Google's site looks like it's a redirector, but this will work too. Um, let's look at the inside of this HTML document. So I'm gonna view source. right click view source yeah so view page source so if we imported this um, using our HTML function okay, what you would see is this okay, and it doesn't <laughs> it scrolls sideways it's just one giant thing so look at all this extra crap right HTML stuff and then there are some websites like I know Fox News does this where it's all hidden in JavaScript so it's even harder to get the actual text somewhere I think Wall Street Journal has the same problem let's look because we do some text scraping projects and it's always a, a chore of figuring out how to get the actual text. Right. All right, let's see. Let's look at Facebook. Okay. So another problem too with a lot of these is if they're uh, content blocked and you have to have access. And so here's a good, oh yeah, here's a great example. All of this here, none of this is the actual like interesting content, it's all the HTML um, and see uh, style sheets, content style sheets. Okay. And then we'll do one more. Okay. Looking at Business Insider, let's look at Walmart this time. Nope, none of that nonsense. Okay, we're not. There we go. So if I look at the page source here, theirs is somewhere in the middle. Okay. So tons of stuff we don't need. Is the main idea here. Um, and so there's this really cool package called Beautiful Soup, and there's some other options too, but Beautiful Soup is the book recommendation that allows us to basically strip all of that out. 
mostly. Okay. Sometimes if you run this and it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, the goal is to just see like when the, the trial and error that you might have to do when you're running these projects. Um, but Beautiful Soup is a uh, package that is part of um, the download for Anaconda and it will get it mostly clean. On some newer JavaScript style pages, um, it just doesn't work very well at all. Okay. Um, uh, so here's an example from Beautiful Soup 4, import Beautiful Soup. We're going to run the Beautiful Soup function on our HTML that we imported and use dot get text. Okay. And that usually pulls out the text for us. If you're an R person, this is kind of like what RVest does when you can open web pages and pull the text from them. But sometimes it just doesn't work because of the formatting of the web page. So some pages don't want you to scrape them because then you're not looking at their ads. Um, so I could take that uh, raw text and we're tokenize it and now this looks like it worked pretty good. So we'll tell you, if you're interested in working with HTML, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, but Beautiful Soup is the kind of package that helps us, uh, is one of the several packages that help us clean up HTML. And then one last example on importing and dealing with files is using your own file. So uh, let's say, for example, I um, have this file where uh, I ask people what makes a flipper a flipper. And so people, of course, are going to list dolphins. Um, some people wrote about flipping people off. Um, some people wrote about uh, the TV show, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll have this saved in a text file. An open function just allows you to open them. A lot of people call files, uh, just F, this is a naming uh, tradition. And so what you do, it's a little odd because I think, I feel like when you open a file, it should have read it already. But remember on all of these, you open them. You either open the URL or you, um, you do some sort of open function. So it might be URL request. Okay. Here it's just open. If you want to do it like this with no extra um, path around it, just put it in the same folder as your Jupyter file. We're going to call that F for file. And then every function that we've run after opening the file, either URL request or open, we've done dot read. Okay. So be sure you understand that there's this like open step and then a reading step. And the reading step is often tied to a decoding as well. Um, this file I didn't have to decode because I <clears throat> I already knew that it was UTF-8 because I made the file. Okay. Um, and then I just printed it out so you could see it's essentially people defining the word flipper. Right. So a whole lot of things can go wrong at this stage. Um, so the file needs to be in the same directory as your Python file unless you're wanting to use a path. Um, then you can link to the specific directory, but you have to be careful because sometimes when I like copy a directory, so let me show you. Let's say I go to where this file is, teaching, folders and folders and folders, right? So here's my flipper file. Right, I can do get info. This will tell me where it is on my computer right here. If I was to copy that and put it in, I would have to change this into the proper formatting. So I'd have to add some quotes. I'd have to add these here should be forward slashes. So um, be careful of forward versus backward slashes. It depends on what computer you're on and kind of what uh, the, how the code wants to process. Generally, they should be forward. If you are on a Windows machine, they look like they should be backwards. So it just kind of depends. And then the book talks a lot more about this. So if you're trying to import files and you're having some trouble, uh, you can read um, some more helpful hints for the book. Okay. Another problem is that Windows, uh, Mac and Linux tend to do the same thing because 
Mac, Macs are running on Unix, which is basically Linux. Um, Windows are different on their end of line characters. So the way those look in computer terms are often different as well. So a um, little bit of trial and error here. So let's say we're trying to create a pipeline, a processing pipeline. So I'm trying to go from start to finish from my importing my file to running some analysis on it. First thing I might do is if I'm pulling it from a website, I could use URL open on my URL and read it in. Um, there's another function called clean HTML that should help clean out the text that's in NLTK. I would say that beautiful soup works a lot better. Um, and we can kind of take out any extra content we're not interested in. So I could trim off all the comments from um, Discus or some other commenting system they're using. This would be the cleaning step. Um, you could convert that to ASCII. This is a specific type of text file. I would argue that mostly you're going to be converting this to Unicode, which we'll cover here in a little bit. Um, we could word tokenize it. This is a different word tokenization function. We've been using word tokenize. There's this word punk tokenize that, uh, that kind of deals with punctuation a little differently. And we could convert it to NLTK text and start playing with um, our functions that we learned in chapter one and two. So this is kind of the pipeline we might use, reading it, cleaning it up, tokenizing it, doing stuff with it. Um, so there's a section here I didn't really want to cover because I don't want, you know, one chapter to take four weeks. Um, that talks a lot about dealing with strings and text processing. So if you're kind of still struggling with a lot of the Python code, I would definitely tell you to go back and read, I mean, read the whole chapter, but this section especially, um, it talks about special characters, like uh, anything on that top row where your number keys are, every character at the top, exclamation points, dollar signs, um, the ampersand symbol above a seven, all those are special characters. You have to do special things to them so that it knows what they are. Um, it talks a lot more about how to add and subtract text, how to do slicing and understanding strings versus lists versus tuples versus dictionaries. So understanding what Python objects are. Um, and then if you're still wanting some more practice on Python, don't forget about Julia that we have access to for free the university and then if you need even more I can provide some extra um, places where you can practice um, because after this point the uh, coding gets to be it's not hard but a lot more there's just more going on because we're doing more complex things um, so how do I this I mean this chapter is really about processing text so how do I deal with um, deal with different uh, languages. Right? So let's say I'm interested in working with um, Polish, for example, and it's got some little extra characters that I don't have in my normal Latin-based English language. Um, so how do I handle that? Right? Um, so most English-speaking people use ASCII encoding. Um, people who are using uh, the like E's with the dots or the AE option are using extended Latin because okay? English is technically a Latin based language. So uh, extended Latin just has all those extra little uh, question, upside down question marks and everything. Um, but Unicode is actually the solution to all of our problems. Um, uh, and so I wish it was a solution to my computer issues, but um, it's the solution to all of my text-based problems. <clears throat> Where each character, no matter what it is, is assigned basically a, a unique code. And if you do that, you can support millions of characters, including emojis. Right? And the way they end up printing out is this little U here for Unicode um, with a slash, and then some sort of four-digit number combination. And that will allow us to represent every language set, character set, 
uniquely without having to do anything special. Um, but to convert to Unicode, you do have to kind of figure out what encoding it is in originally. And so I always just Google like what encoding is um, Arabic in <laughs> to help me process that properly. Because you do have to decode and encode, and so here's kind of a, this picture of how this might look. Here are a couple of different file formats. We've been using UTF-8, Latin 2 is an extended Latin. So I'm going to decode that into Unicode, where every character gets its own U set. And then I could encode that back into a different one. So generally the processing happens here at the Unicode stage. <clears throat> but I could decode it from UTF-8 to Latin 2. Um, and sometimes when you open a file that you haven't used before, it actually will give you this warning, like, I don't know what file format this is, so we're going to make it into UTF. Um, I have this problem a lot with CSV files, uh, working from Windows to Mac sometimes, where it's just kind of, there's a, some random little character in there that it doesn't like. <laughs> And so it ends up encoding it as this weird number set. And that weird number set is Unicode. <clears throat> now that I know that, it's a little easier to work with. All right. So I'm going to play with this specific file. And you should have this file. But since we're all working with different computers, so this is an issue uh, as data analysts and data science becomes more globalized, we're going to be working on lots of computers. So we might be using GitHub, where everybody's got a different formatting set, um, where your computer's name is different from my computer's name. I'm using Mac, so you're using Windows, and so we've all got different structures and file formats. So a really nice thing that we can do is use this data.find function. And what it does is if you tell it the name of the file you're looking for, it will find it. Here we're very specifically told it to go look in the corpora folder because it because we this is an NLTK file and we know that's where it should be. But you could use this if you had a specific data file so that um, each person's computer who's working with the file would find it where it's supposed to be. Okay, if you're an R person, this is very similar to here, the here function. Um, so it's finding where here is. So on my computer, this happens to be users, Buchanan, NLTK data, and then it finds the rest of it. Okay, so that's just a really handy function for working cross computers. And then now I'm going to open it. Remember the rules are open, decode, right? Open or read, etc. And I've said that it's Latin too. Okay, so I've kind of warned it. PPS. This is going to be a, a, a character set that normally my computer doesn't work with very well. And then I'm just going to print it out okay. just to show you. So <clears throat> uh, usually this will show on people's computers, but every once in a while we'll have a computer that can't do it. Uh, and you'll see uh, some either question marks or some weird formatting here. But since I warned the computer that's Latin too, it has encoded and decoded for me. So now I can see all the little symbols and this is in Polish. So you could set the encoding for an entire script um, by using this kind of command. Okay. And so we fill in co the coding where it's in the angle brackets here with the type of coding that you're going to use, and here it's UTF-8. Okay. And it does start with a, a comment okay. <clears throat> and the little quotes. Okay. So on here that's not a mistake. It's like these weird, it's a weird quoted comment at the beginning. So it's a special type of comment that a Python document like p.py could to have read. Okay. I'm not entirely sure if this works well in Jupyter, but it should. It's still a Python document. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to regular expressions. So if you are not very good at regular expressions, um, if you don't know what they are, you're probably not very good at them because I'm not very good at them, and I've been doing them for 10 plus years. So... Uh, what I did was on Moodle, 
Oh, da, 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 da. We're here, sorry. Um, there is a link here under chapter five for some reason uh, about how to uh, learn regular expressions, build your own. Right? Uh, I don't know that this first link will be that handy until you've kind of learned what they are, but there's this regular expression um, tutorial because when I say here, oops, wrong window, that regular expressions are everything, much like how I think WordNet is the shiz, <laughs> um, they, they truly are the most useful thing that you can learn um, uh, for the next couple of chapters, okay, because we're going to use them from now until the end of the term. Um, and so what are, what are regular expressions, if you're not familiar? It's pattern matching. So it's a way for us to write in code, I want this set of patterns of things. Okay. So anytime you do a control F on your computer, command F, or we're doing the find option, that's just a very specific regular expression. Um, you can get less specific where you're trying to find everything that starts with WH is one of the examples from the homework. Um, or you could find every vowel or every comma or every num number. So uh, you can be find every time you see the word car or you could be like find every word that includes C-A-R in any part of the word. So we can get more and less specific. And we imported the re function earlier because it's regular expression options for Python. And I'm going to pull out this word list here. So back to loops. This is give me the words, um, four words in the words data set. Remember here, this is the words corpus, pull out the words. So it's uh, words.words .words because this is the name of the corpus and this is the function. So all the English words, if they're in lowercase. Okay. So we've got now a list of all English words in lowercase. And you can kind of see aardvark here. And let me sort through that. I want to find all of my potentially past tense verbs. So the general rule for past tense in English is that it ends in ed. There are lots of words that end in ed that are not past tense, but this could get us started. And so to do that, I am going to, so here's the preview here. I'm going to look for ed with a dollar sign at the end. Okay. The dollar sign does not literally mean a dollar sign. If you want a literal dollar sign, you have to do some special, um, uh, some, so you have to escape it or use backslashes. Um, but the dollar sign here indicates a word boundary. It means it's at the end of the word. Okay. The caret symbol that is over the six is for the beginning of the word. Okay. So this will allow us to find everything that ends in ed. And so the function here, right here is re for the re package. Function is dot search. Um, and this allows us to loop through or to search a, a string set. However, what we have is a list. So what I want to do is loop over each word in the list, search the word, see if it ends in ed, and then print it out. If we had the raw data, um, we could just tell it to search the raw data and it would print out um, uh, the indices of where those are. Okay. So read.search works a little odd. It, the easiest way personally for me is to take a list, loop over the list and just search each one to see if it is. But we'll also talk about the find all function that will allow you to find um, specific places in a, a string, a larger string. Okay. All right, so here's a couple of uh, ed words from English. And so this now can be used to find specific pairs. It can be used to um, write your own grammar, which we'll do at the end of the semester. Uh, and so regular expressions are something we're going to use from every chapter from here on out. So it's worth taking the time of trying to understand just a little bit. I don't think, I mean, if you do it every day, I bet you find, you remember them, but I don't. 
So I would say that as long as you can kind of understand, okay, I want to find the end of a word. I know that there's a pattern for that. Let me search it. Um, so just kind of uh, getting the hang of uh, a little bit of the idea of how they work will help you at least find the rule that you're looking for. Um, we could use wild cards. Wild cards are placeholders saying something should be there, but it doesn't denote what it should be. That's a period. Okay. Uh, stars are a little different. They're, they're a different type of wild card. The character, or I'm sorry, the carrot is the start of a word. And so this is very weirdly specific, just to show you how like weird English is. Uh, here, this is, okay, the start of the word should have two letters, bam, bam, a J, two more letters, then a T, then two more letters, and be over. Okay, so we're specifically looking for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letter words that have a J in the third spot and a T in the sixth spot. Okay. Um, so we're using the uh, carrot and the dollar sign to indicate word boundaries. This should be the beginning and the end of the word. We're using the dots to indicate any character and then specifically J and T. And there are more words that one might expect uh, on this sort of thing. So we looped over our word list. And there's actually quite a few. Uh, and now we can see our words that are very similar, likely due to English, uh, British, and normalization. So it's E-R-O-R. If instead you want to say, uh, I want to find any one of these characters. So uh, the homework will have you write a pig Latin function uh, where you're trying to find the vowels in a word. So here's an example of how that might look. Uh, so we want the start of a word here. And then anything in brackets means give me any one of these. So this could be PQR. Right? Here we've made it A-E-I-O-U to denote any um, vowels. And so it's basically like, give me any word that starts with a vowel. And then if I print that out, there's a, a lot of them. So I just printed the first 10, but it loops over each one of our words, sees if they start with a vowel. And if they start with a vowel, it gives it back to me. If not, it sends it away. Okay. So this is any word that starts with a vowel. Mm -hmm. So now you can see how we're, we're uh, with regular expressions, we're able to flexibly find almost anything. Uh, let's do a couple more. The plus symbol is really nice because it allows us to find um, repeated letters. So the chat corpus here is, remember, a bunch of people talking back and forth. And so if I pull all of the words from the chat corpus, okay, pull out the words, I'm going to take the set of them. Remember that set gives me the unique list of words. I sorted them just so they're in alphabetical order. Now I've looped over chat words and I found any time that someone had started with an M and ends with an E, it's got M-I-N-E, but whatever combination of, um, extra letters is allowed. So we'll find just M-I-N-E here. It has to have each one, but it can have one or more of them. So the plus symbol here is one or more of these. Whereas the star symbol is uh, zero or more of these. Okay. So this combination actually will return a blank space because a blank space is zero or more of these. So it's essentially zero M-I-N-E's. But then it returns a single letter E because that counts. And then every combination of N and uh, N's and just random E's as well. Um, so it actually returned N, I-N, because there's zero or more M's, zero or more I's, zero or more N's, zero or more E's. Okay, so remember plus is one or more, star is zero or more. Okay. And with that, we can go freaking nuts. So we could find all kinds of things. Okay. Um, 
So the find all function, this is search. Okay. Search, I feel like works best on a list and loops over the list and you search the individual components of the list. There's also a find all function, which works better on a single character string. Okay. And so it finds all of the non-overlapping matches. So you do re.findall. You put in the uh, rules, the regular expression. So here this is giving you all the vowels and uh, what you want to search. So here it gave me every instance of a vowel. So if I put all of crime and punishment into one giant text string and asked it to find all of the words the, it would. And so it would just print out V, 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 V. So we could use that to count. There are easier ways to do that, but we could use that to count. Um, or we can use it to find collocates. So I like re find all when I'm trying to find pairs of words together. So I might say find all the times that um, the example in a minute is bro, but uh, find all the times that someone said hey you in the chat corpus. Um, so here we've pulled the Wall Street Journal okay, from TreeBank. So Penn's TreeBank, we've grabbed all the words, we've made a unique list of words. I'm going to create a frequency distribution okay, of all of the two letter combinations in those words in the Wall Street Journal. So looping over words in the Wall Street Journal uh, and looping over essentially every couple of letters. What we're going to do is find A, E, I, O, U and at least two of them. Okay. So this little curly bracket denotes that there should be two of them from this set. And so it finds I O E A I E. So this shows us all of the con uh, I'm sorry, vowel clusters in English, okay. and how often those vowel clusters are occurring. And so the most common one is actually I O. I would have thought the most common one would be E A or E E, but E E is actually in the middle. Okay. So this allowed us to pull um, and kind of think about vowel clusters. Now the reason I use frequency distribution is because I wanted to count how many times they happened. I could have just looped over it, made a giant list, but frequency distribution, remember, allows us to keep track of how many times each unique set is happening. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, so I can also use tabulate is a very cool function. So we're kind of, I'm trying to import or I'm trying to pull information from the first couple of chapters into this. So you can see how a regular expressions can be applied to the things we've already done. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is pull uh, um, consonant vowels okay, looping over our words in this very specific dictionary. Okay, and this is a, a language. So let's see, this is a language spoken east of New Guinea. Okay, so um, not a um, super popular language, but it has a really interesting alphabet. So what we're going to do is we're going to find all of the consonant vowel clusters using refind all, <clears throat> where it starts or it not even starts with, it has first a P, T, K, S, V, and R, which are the most common um, uh, consonants, uh, yeah, consonants, uh, and then pull a vowel so that we get um, every combination of first phoneme and second phoneme, right, that are consonant vowels within these particular uh, sets and create a conditional frequency distribution. Right. Now remember that the conditional frequency distributions are essentially a giant table of this variable, excuse me, consonants, bar vowels, that variable. Right. And so instead of being just one giant list of all of our vowel clusters, 
now we have a table of how many times the letter K is then followed by an AEIOU. And this creates some really cool distributions. So these are often considered um, bigram frequencies. And so word frequency and letter frequency are very important at predicting almost everything in natural language processing. Uh, if you don't know the answer, a good guess is frequency. Um, but what we really see are bigram frequencies. This is every pair of letters um, because those are often how we pronounce words are by um, individual bigrams. And so they predict our ability to read aloud and that sort of thing. Um, and so if I wanted to know, is there a pattern to bigrams in language? The answer is yes, right? So in English, CK is a pretty common pattern. In other languages, you'd never see CK, right? Um, you would never in English see, see like QO. We just don't do that. It's always QU, right? Um, uh, so here, do we see a pattern? Well, uh, K is generally followed by A or O, whereas P is almost uniquely followed by I. S only has one option. The next letter is I, so this is like Q in English. T is never followed by an I, though. Mostly by O, and then some words that are pretty evenly split. So this allows us to look at bigram frequencies, which is the easiest way to do that is with regular expressions. And what we do with regular expressions is we then take that and build up to more complicated questions. So the word tokenization function underneath it all is using a, a large set of regular expressions. So it looks for white spaces, boundaries between words, it looks for periods, trying to figure out acronyms or abbreviations like etc. <clears throat> um, and all of that's regular expressions. Uh, the way that uh, stimming or limitization works is through regular expressions. So let me explain the difference between the two. So stimming is usually only a regular expression where you are just taking affixes. These are the, the, the uh, pre, ing, ed, ious. I made a list here. Um, those are suffixes, but we might also pull off affixes like un, un, or in. Um, and just taking them off. So when you stem something, you're just pulling off the stems. Okay. Limitization is where you're using a dictionary lookup. So stemming won't catch the fact that morning, the word morning, like early in the day, is not an ing word. Okay. So we were actually doing some stemming recently where we had the word wings, because airplanes have wings. Okay. It made the word wings W because an S is an affix we can take off, and an ING is an affix that I can take off, so I'm left with the letter W, and that's not really what I wanted. Okay. Limitization knows that wings is plural and converts it into wing. Okay. It knows that run is the past tense, uh, or I'm sorry, ran is the past tense of run, right? um, whereas stimming wouldn't, wouldn't deal with any of the um, irregular conjugations of words. Uh, so MLTK, NLTK has a bunch of stimmers built in, um, and these are regular expression sets. Limitization is more of a dictionary lookup problem. Okay. And so we can, um, we can find things through regular expression. I do feel like this particular slide was supposed to be before this, but anyway. Um, Let's look at kind of a fun example. Okay. So if I pull things from NPS chat, now this here, I left a little note, is a very specific version of regex that's specific to NLTK text objects. So the little um, uh, alligator brackets, the less than and the greater than sign, are um, specific to this type of object. Generally, you can just hit the space or you can use a slash b for word boundary in regular regular expressions. Okay. Uh, so if you start playing with this, please know that this is a very specific instance. Okay. So we saved the chat text as a text file. I used find all. 
And this will give us any instance of the, a word, a word, and then the word bro. <laughs> okay. um, and so we came up with you rule bro, telling you bro, and you twisted bro from the chat corpus. Okay. If I wanted to do this in um, without being an NLTK text file, I could do something like slash b uh, dot star. So um, now a dot star would be zero or more objects. Okay, we might do a dot plus okay, slash b uh, for word boundary, um, and then do the same thing slash b oops, dot star slash b and then the word slash b bro slash b okay. to tell it I want these to be the word boundaries or we would get uh, word word brother as well okay. um, yeah and then sometimes you don't need the slashes it just kind of depends on the flavor of regular expressions because there's a couple of different types of them as well I was just run it, and if it looks like what I was wanting, it ran. If it is not quite what I was wanting, it didn't run. So then I have to figure out if there's none of those instances or if I've typed my code wrong. And there are several websites that will help you translate into regex correctly. All right. So a little bit of um, finishing up processing text. Okay, so we should get through chapter three tonight. Um, normalization is where I convert the text to every single, the same type. So this might be encoding and decoding, lower casing, uh, normalizing between British English and American English. So if there's two different dialects with slightly different spellings, we might fix those sorts of things. Um, stimming we've talked about is where we take the affixes off the word. And then limitization is uh, making sure that it's in a dictionary and we might convert back into the root word. So what I'm going to do here is pull in this um, weird text. Okay, I don't, I don't remember where this comes from. It says in the book, but it's definitely an odd piece of text. Right? Um, and then I'm going to convert it from raw into tokenization form. So word tokenize, again, I said is a very specific set of regex rules. And so it knows that this colon is not really meant to be part of that word. Um, so it does treat punctuation as a separate word, which we can then pull out if we were interested. Um, and then I might stem this. Okay, so there's two big stimmers uh, that are really popular. The Porter stimmer, developed by Martin Porter. This is really popular for English. If you've heard of the Snowball stimmer, that's the new version of the Porter stimmer. It's the same guy. And then the Lancaster stimmer which was created at Lancaster University. Um, and they do slightly differently. So one of the things to do in the homework is to compare the two against each other. Okay. And so we're on import Porter Stimmer, and then import Lancaster Stimmer, tell it to just stem. So what you do is Porter, because it's the name of the function, dot stem, tell it to stem your tokens one at a time. And then check out what it does. So for the Porter Stimmer, it takes the word Dennis and converts that to Denny because it has an S on the end and it will strip off every S on the end of a word, does not matter what it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, listen, strange, it strips off the E here um, because uh, some words that pulls it back to the root. It does not fix the problem that women is plural, but it does change lying into lie. So there are some like kind of interesting um, pieces here. Okay, distributing, it took off the ing, kind of et cetera. Okay, it took off the I, E, V, I, V, E for executive. Let's look at the Lancaster stemmer now. Okay, this time it took off the NIS for Dennis. <laughs> okay. For listen, it took off EN. It left strange. For woman, it converted that to W O M. Okay. So um, slightly different rules, okay. uh, and I would say that sometimes these are not interpretable um, because it's um, based on their their regular expression rules. 
you can get it back into words that you don't even know what the word should have been anymore. Um, so sometimes stemming is really handy, sometimes it's not. So we'll talk about when you use it more later. Now limitization is a little better, but I found that the WordNet limitizer is not the best one in NLTK. And the, there's a better one in using the tree bank option. So Penn's tree bank is, um, captures more words because WordNet, remember, is only nouns and verbs. So um, it does have to be in WordNet. Uh, so we're, it'll handle some of these weird plurals, but it doesn't really handle some verb types very well because lying is um, essentially in there too many times. It doesn't know which one's which. So um, it does change women to woman, singular, but at least distributing alone, and that should probably be distribute, right? Um, and left government alone, even though it probably should be govern. Okay. So limitization is pretty difficult. Oops, sorry, thought I had that turned off. Okay. Um, uh, so limitization is pretty difficult, so I'm just trying to say. Depends on the dictionary that you have. All right, so to end up, what we're going to talk about is how you could write your own regular expression um, tokenization option. Okay, so we could use the word underscore tokenize, which is what we're going to do most of the semester because it's really good. They've had a lot of practice at this. But if you're working with a special corpus type, like the NPS chat corpus, um, or uh, things that don't fit kind of your normal typing rules, like people are using things differently, like maybe Twitter. Okay. How can we have more control over what is getting tokenized as a word or not? So one problem you have if you use the word tokenization options for, for Twitter is it breaks up uh, links very weirdly. Uh, so we could take a sentence like this that has a bunch of dashes and a bunch of dots and some um, special characters. Okay. And we could try tokenizing by saying, okay, give me any word um, with a space after it. Okay. Uh, and so this actually pulls that uh, print and the cost. So this is not a very good set of, of regular expression rules. So we'd have to figure out how to write this in a way that would get us each word, um, you know, this one with the dots, um, poster, print, should be two words. Okay. Um, so generally word space boundaries, like the white space would help. Um, but here we would be dealing with a lot of different things at once. Okay. And one reason this is a little different than the book because the book example no longer works. So you'd have to kind of play with the rules until you got it correct. Uh, moving up a level though, how do we break apart sentences? And so word tokenization is hard enough with commas and periods that aren't really ends of sentences. A question mark sometimes are ends of sentences. Sometimes it's um, Sometimes it's embedded text, exclamation points, like how do we know where the sentence is ending? Right. Uh, and so there's a function I've built for that called sent tokenize. Okay. And let's see here, let's pull out um, Alice in Wonderland. Okay. And I use the sentence tokenize function on it. And I told it to pretty print. Okay. Um, this just makes it look cute. Right. So. Uh, there was nothing uh, so very remarkable, nor did Alice think it so. So notice that it missed the fact that this is actually two uh, semicolon means different sentences. Okay. Um, then the next sentence, very much out of the way to hear the rabbit to it, say to itself, oh dear. Okay. But it did handle the fact that this is one embedded set of sentences. Okay. And the way this function works underneath is a set of specific regex rules. Um, so when I say regex is the shiz, <laughs> it's very important because a lot of the functions that we're going to build on for the rest of the semester, part of speech tagging, tokenization, are using regular expressions underneath. So for everything we're going to do from here on out, you could customize it by making your own set of regex rules. 
the hard part about that is figuring out how to make them work properly and giving you back what you're interested in. Uh, and this is where using some of those websites I've provided can be really handy.